Good evening. Good to see everybody. Uh, Lord's richest blessings as we are at the third Sunday in Lent, but this is also Lutheran Schools Week that we kick off. And so we give thanks for our wonderful Lutheran school, and they'll be celebrating throughout the week and with the pancake breakfast tomorrow. We give thanks. Our theme, kind of a usual one, is entitled Mad About You. But before we get into our service, would you do me a favor? Would you rise and would you uh, greet each other with the peace of the Lord? Good to see you. Good evening. Good evening. God's peace be with you. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace be with you, man. God's peace. God's peace be with you. God's peace. God's peace be with each of you. God's peace over there. God's peace up there. Our opening hymn is 728. Uh, you can follow along either project on the screen or in the hymnal, How Firm a Foundation, 728. May God bless our worship today. As you're able, we rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we've sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Jesus and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We take a moment of silence for reflection.
we confess together. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. You may be seated as we sing 575, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, 575. Lord be with you. Let us pray. We pray together in unison the collect of the day. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today is from Exodus chapter 20, beginning with the first verse. 
And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under this earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you, la you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with the 18th verse. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This is the gospel. This, therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with the review of the catechism as we look at the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. From Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, 
He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. And 1 John 3, 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brothers in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. We continue with an anthem from the St. Peter's School Children. As you're able, we rise to the reading of our Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. This also serves as our text for today's message. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus has spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Congregation may be seated. I invite your children who'd like to come forward for a message to do so at this time. you guys doing? Good. And for all those who sang, thank you. You guys did a great job. And it's good to be with you in God's house. You like the weather outside? Yeah, kind of. It's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, for March, you think about it, how beautiful and what a wonderful day. And even better to be in God's house with you, worshiping our great and gracious God. Let me ask you this. How many of you guys like to clean? Anybody like to clean? I might have to take notes here because I might, no, I'm just kidding. For those who like to clean, how many of you have to clean even though you don't like it? Do you have to clean your room sometimes? Yeah, when do you have to clean your room? Yeah. When it's, whenever it's what? Messy. So what does messy look like? Stuff all over the place. That sounds like it was when I was little. Is that for you guys too? You got to do clean up when? How about when you toys? You play with your toys? You clean up your toys after you've played with them? Hopefully you do. Yeah, cleaning, cleaning. So I'm going to talk about cleaning a little bit. So I've got a picture there. See some things that you see. What are some things that you see that are used to clean? Yes. A uh, vacuum. Any of you touched a vacuum before? Yep. All right. Again, I'm taking notes here. All right. Got vacuumers. Very good. How about, how about some of the other things you see? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, all sorts of different things for scrubbing. You guys ever have to do some scrubbing? Anybody ever scrub the tub? That's probably not my, my favorite thing to do, scrubbing the tub. And how about oven? Anybody ever scrub an oven before? Not the most enjoyable work, but it has to be done occasionally, or other things. Dishes. You do dishes? Yeah? How many actually do it with hand? Really? Wow. Pretty cool. Cleaning. You like to clean? Some of you. Now, some of you are changing your mind after you're seeing all these things here. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think God likes to clean? Think God likes to clean? He does. He cleans. In fact, one of our readings for today, we heard Jesus did some cleaning, but he didn't use a vacuum, and he didn't use gloves or a brush. Did anybody hear what he used to clean with? I don't think you guys would expect it. A whip. You guys know what a whip is? Yeah. Yeah, whip the, they whip with things. And we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? But you know what? He found when he came to God's house, it was messy, really messy. Not messy with dirt, with things like we use a vacuum cleaner, but some not so good things. No, it'd be kind of like if you came to church today and you found animals all over the place running around. You think that would be a good thing? Why not? Why not? You think that's why we're here? No. Not about the animals, but we're here about Jesus. Ah, oh, I was hoping you'd say that. We're here about Jesus, yeah. And you know what? Jesus is all about forgiveness. And if you got animals running around all the place and people buying and selling things, you think they will be able to focus on Jesus? No. Okay, all right. So he cleans it in an unusual way, but he's pointing to a different day when he's going to do some other cleaning. 
In fact, this is a Monday on, on a Friday, just not even a week later. Something's going to happen. He's going to do some cleaning for us, too. Anybody know what he's going to use to do cleaning? What? Oh, very good. He's going to die on the cross. He's going to use a cross to clean us. You know, we can clean all these different things around here, but let me ask you this. Can you clean your heart? You can't. Only one can really clean our heart of all of our wrong. And who's that? And he does it by dying on the cross to pay for all of our sins. But then something amazing happened on the third day. What happened on the third day, do you know? Yeah, he rose from the grave. He beat sin, death, and the power of the devil to set us free that we might know of his forgiveness, that we might come and worship him and focus on him and his love and forgiveness. And that we can then go out and share that love and forgiveness with everybody. That's where the focus needs to be, right? On Jesus. May it ever be. Would you do me a favor? Would you hold your hands and bow your heads? Pray with me. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you even for that day when you went to the temple and you cleaned it. But especially we thank you that you've cleaned our hearts You've cleaned us of our sin. And in our baptism, you've washed us and you've made us your own. Help us to know always that love and forgiveness and share it with everyone. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. You can go back to your seats as we sing our sermon hymn, which is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 426. God's grace and peace be multiplied unto each of you today from God our Father and from our risen Savior Jesus. Amen. Our text is from our gospel lesson from John chapter 2, read a few moments ago, Jesus cleansing the temple. Please join with me in a word of prayer. We pray. Heavenly Father, be with us this day as we come to your house and hear your word. We pray that you might help us to ever fix our hearts and eyes on you and in repentance and faith ever know of the forgiveness and salvation you secured through your cross and empty tomb. I pray now that the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart, may they ever be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, unusual title, mad about you. Uh, no, I'm not talking about, there was a series, a sitcom several years ago, Mad About You. This phrase came way back before that, Mad About You. It actually comes from English, Mad About You. Now, if my wife says that she is mad at me, that's not a good thing. But if my wife tells me she's mad about me, then... Well, I might ask some questions. What do you mean by that before I respond? That you're mad about me, mad about you. When we say mad about you, it means a different thing. Sometimes people use the word crazy about you or intensely strong feelings, love towards you, passionate about you. That's what we're talking about today as we hear God's word. In our text for today, we see a, uh, a very different side of Jesus here, don't we? A lot of times we use that, what would Jesus do? And today we kind of go, well, I think I'm going to cover up my WWJD today because cleansing the temple, I don't know about that. He's overturning tables and scattering money. He makes a whip out of cords. And he drives people, the men and animals, from the temple. At least it appears it doesn't look like any model evangelism program I've ever seen. It's not the Jesus we're used to see. And yet this is the same Jesus. It's not the gentle Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's not the Jesus who dines with tax collectors and sinners and touches untouchable like the lepers. It's not the Jesus we're used to, you and I. And yet this isn't a different Jesus. This is the same one who's come for us and for all people. This isn't Jesus acting out of character either. This is Jesus still acting out of love and compassion. This is Jesus caring for his people, just like you and me. Jesus is God, and God is love, and Jesus is love. And this is Jesus in his love, in action. It's a love that cannot stand by while people are being harassed and bullied and driven from the house of God, and the focus taken away where it needs to be, on him, on God. It wasn't the house it was the temple. And that's, that was important to remember. The truth is, God said he was happy also, though, with the traveling tent. Remember that? The tabernacle. In fact, God designed the tabernacle. Who designed the temple? It was David. The temple itself, of itself, was not as important as God and his people. It was what took place in the temple or in the tabernacle that was important. It was a place of repentance and forgiveness, of prayer, of worship. It was a place where God and man were brought together, reconciled, we use the word. It was where sin was dealt with, with a death blow where blood was shed. And as repentance is offered and forgiveness is given, a place of hope and faith in God and his promises, a place that's meant for all people, including you and me. The house of God was supposed to be a house of prayer, a house of faith, a house of forgiveness, a house of holiness. And it had been turned into a not a Walmart, but maybe you might say a Temple Mart. What had started probably out to be good intentions, providing sacrificial animals for travelers that they could buy sacrifices, 
had turned into a focus on money over souls and forgiveness. God's people not receiving the spiritual care God wanted them to have and the people needed. Forgiveness had turned it into a business. And the great treasures of God's love and his grace had been to reduced into savings account with a good interest rate, you might say. Something had gone wrong, gone rotten. That something was the most important thing of all, the forgiveness of God that we all need, not just people then, but all people. We see this all too well at the now quickening Easter time. Hard to believe, almost Easter. They'll be here before we know it at Holy Week. When things get busy, when things get hectic for us as people, when God gets lost in the shuffle and becomes just one more thing to check off, of the list of things that we get done that day. We need a little bit more Mary, who sat and dwelt before Jesus, and a little less of Martha, who forgot the one thing that was needed. And perhaps we still come to church, we may still pray, we may still read his word, but sometimes we don't always do it for the right reason either, do we? Motivation. Does the business of God replace the forgiveness of God? Are there times we've whittled our Lord's forgiveness down to a transaction, empty meaning? I mean, what is God's forgiveness worth? What is reconciling with God worth? I think, you know, it's something that we can't purchase. It can't be won. It has to be given and freely out of love. It's easy for us to look back at what happened at the temple and think they got what was coming to them. Those hard-headed, ungrateful people. It's easier to look at those people. Sometimes it's a little harder to look in the mirror, though, isn't it? And to examine ourselves and our sin you and I. We need perhaps a little bit madness in our hearts, a little Lenten turning over at times of the tables in our hearts, yours and mine, driving out of the beasts of sin that have settled in and made themselves at home replacing him and forgiveness. We need the love, compassion, and passion of God that isn't going to let go our own way and follow our way. Isn't it amazing? He's not satisfied with the 99, isn't he? He goes after even that one that still is astray. He's got a passionate love for us and for all, doesn't he? And we need that love and we need that passion of our Lord and our God that won't let go, that will not let us stay in our sin and die. God loves to give life and forgiveness and desires all to be his forever. We need the love, the compassion, and passion of God that gives the law to reveal our sin, to cleanse the tainted temples of our hearts. We need the love, the compassion, and passion of God that cuts to heal, that kills to make alive, that dies to give life. We need the love, the compassion, and passion of God that caused him well, to send his one and only son to take up our sins and be our savior. On Monday is a funeral of one of our members. She would have been 102 years old on Monday. Pretty amazing. When a person dies, we try to search to see if we can find a confirmation verse. She was born and raised, and all her life was a member of St. Peter's. We found it. It was Romans 8.32. 
one of my favorite verses. He, being the Heavenly Father, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? We have a passionate God who would not even withhold his own son and Jesus, his own life, to set us free from sin. We need the love and passion and compassion of God that consumes Jesus with zeal, with fervor for the temple building and the temple of your heart and mine. We need the love, compassion, and passion of God that will drive us to repentance that we might then receive forgiveness and restoration and life. And thank God we have such a God who is completely consumed with you and me. He's consumed with your forgiveness and reconciliation to make us his own and keep us his own. He cares about every detail about your and my life. He cares about how you live. He cares about the things that you and I do. He cares when he sees you and I are wandering off on a narrow road apart from him. He cares when he sees you hurting yourself and myself with the things that we do and say and think and leave undone. Things that all too often might appear harmless at first. He cares so much that he's willing to step in to do something about it even if we don't want it or think we need it. And it's in that very stepping in that not only works in our hearts and lives to drive us to repentance, to turn away from our sin, but that has provided a new temple. A new temple that has taken a place of the old one. A new temple that isn't anchored to a foundation in the ground in Jerusalem, it's a new place where God dwells with his people. Not in stone, but in flesh and bone. A new place where God and people are reconciled, brought together, and where forgiveness takes place. The new temple of which Jesus said, destroy this temple, being his body, and I will raise it in three days. That's what Easter's all about, isn't it? Not busyness, not a rabbit, or bunny, or eggs. So that's okay, but not away from the focus. It's about Emmanuel, God with us. It's about Jesus who destroyed, was destroyed on the cross and was raised up on the third day. So that while the other temple, the old temple, is long gone, this new temple is still with us and will always be. And as he works repentance and faith and forgiveness and strengthens faith through the word and the sacrament, he takes yourself, that temple, at the sacred table of the Holy Supper in Holy Communion, you are also in baptism a temple of the Holy Spirit as he abides in you and he's cleansed you. The new temple, Jesus comes to us in love and compassion and passion to forgive, to teach, to lead, to heal, to speak, to cleanse, to wash, to free, and to feed us. Jesus is here to care for his people, his church, his bride. He feeds our faith through his word and through his sacraments. And he's still, this very day, completely consumed with love for you and for me and for all people. That's the Jesus who walked in the temple in Jerusalem. He's the Lamb of God who caused all other sacrificial lambs to be obsolete. His is the one upon whom he was whipped. He was scorned. And he was the one who died. He is the one who has redeemed us, not with gold or silver, 
but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death in our place and for that of the world. It is his, as he is the one who is consumed with love for us, consumed by our sin on the cross. He absorbs it, and yet he pays for it, and he rises from the grave that we might be his forever, forgiven and restored. The one consumed with us is consumed by our death in his death, and yet is risen and lives to give forgiveness and life through faith in him alone. And he's the one whom we, when we come to his holy supper, receive his very body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of life now and eternally. His life into our life and our life into his. All for one purpose that we might live with him forever. That as he dwells with us here in our home, we too might dwell with him there in his, our heavenly home, eternal home. That was his amazing plan. When the new temple came to Jerusalem, the old temple would pass away. That Jesus be made the sure foundation of both our lives here and our lives eternal was always the plan, God's plan. And so that's why St. Paul said, we preach Christ crucified and risen. Not a God we can try to control. Not a God we can fully understand, thanks be to God. Not a God who puts up with us. Not a God who is content to let us go our own ways or just blink or close his eyes to our sin. He is a God who one Passover long ago wreaked a little havoc in the temple and then a lot of havoc on the cross and through the empty tomb. And in so doing, he conquered sin and death and the devil and hell and redeemed you and me as his own. He could not stand by and cannot still. It is his love, his compassion, and passion. He comes to you to redeem, to save, to uphold, to restore. Not mad at you, but mad about you. Consumed with his amazing love for you and me and all. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in the true faith unto life everlasting through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. As you're able at this time, we rise as we sing our operatory hymn, Prayed in Me, and the offering is brought forward. Created me. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, lead your church on earth to be a house of prayer for all people. Disrupt our petty preferences and our cultural bias so that we might welcome people from every nation, language, and background. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, as you delivered the people out of slavery in Egypt and taught them how to live as your people, so teach us to live according to your righteousness and your grace so that we may live peacefully and live for you and for love of our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. O Lord our God, we acknowledge your great goodness toward us and praise you for the mercy and grace that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have known. Bless the teaching of your word in our schools, in our colleges and universities. Especially we give thanks this Lutheran Schools Week for our Lutheran school at St. Peter's. Guard and protect students from harm and danger in both body and soul. Be with all those who teach that they may faithfully and with joy proclaim the good news of your love and teach the children, the students, that they might grow in faith and in their minds. Keep us in this day in your gracious care, securely trusting in your everlasting goodness and love. And may we ever give you all glory and praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you are well acquainted with grief and death. Bring your comfort to all those who are suffering in grief. We especially pray, O oh Lord, for the family of Doris Kruger, the family of Dorothy Bornman, the family of Ella Mae Lemoyne, and all who mourn. Grant your presence, peace, and care, and give them the comfort and the hope of the reunion and resurrection for all those who've died in the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we pray that you ever be with those who are in need of your healing, your blessing, and care. We remember Rock Fredette, Rustin Knudsen, Seth Schultz, Cindy Burbridge, Vienna Lee, Larry Craker, Mary Bushweiler, Merlin Meyer, Ken Rosensky, Pastor John Sugatan, and those we name in our hearts. Give them your, whole, your care, your strength, that they might ever know your peace and be granted the assurance of the life now and eternal that is ours through you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we pray that you continue to grant your blessing and guidance as we continue to seek a principal for our school at St. Peter's next year. Lead us to know whom you have chosen to serve in that position. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Strengthen all missionaries, church workers, and pastors, all who work for you. Embolden them to teach and to preach the power of your cross. Encourage them in their service by the same message they proclaim and share, that you've died and risen for us and our salvation and for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we commend all of these people and situations into your hands for you have promised to hear our prayers and intercede for us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against me. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May be seated as we sing Amazing Grace 744.
receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is Built on the Rock 645. Once again, good evening. And we welcome each of you, especially if you're a guest, we welcome you. As soon as everyone, please sign the card in the pew. Uh, and if you haven't already, hand it to us on the way out or put in the offering plate. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, just uh, announcement uh, tomorrow uh, for uh, we have our pancake breakfast beginning, uh, what, 7 to what he said. There you go. And tell you what, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I've always enjoyed it. I usually get there early with the services and everything, but uh, looking forward to it. You also heard in the, uh, I mentioned in the message in the prayers that Doris Kruger uh, was called to her heavenly home through faith in Jesus. Her uh, funeral is on Monday at uh, 
uh, at 11 a.m. at the Farber Funeral Home. Uh, she, uh, her visitation is from 10 to 11, all in one day. Uh, and as I stated, she would have been 102 years old on Tuesday. And uh, she rejoices with her Lord in heaven through faith in Jesus. And what a, what a wonderful blessing. So um, as well, we have our midweek Lent coming up. Uh, we have adult instruction class as well. There's going to be no uh, Bible class and there'll be no Sunday school tomorrow with the pancake breakfast. Um, a lot of other wonderful things. National School Week. We uh, uh, look forward to all the, all the events going on. Have a very blessed evening and week ahead. Make sure you greet each other with the peace of the Lord. The Lord be with you.